the incredible journey of life. From birth, through infancy, childhood, puberty, adulthood, and a slow maturity to old age. This is the story of our lives from a unique perspective, deep inside our bodies. This is the journey of a human life from the outside in. A fetus develops in the womb. It's an astonishing 40-week journey from a single cell to a baby ready to be born. Its body is a miracle of microscopic design. Tiny, perfectly formed organs, each made up of billions of perfectly functioning cells. These cells are the building blocks of our bodies. They make us what we are, a hundred thousand billion cells, all working in harmony. Inside every cell is the same extraordinary engine, the machine that tells each cell how to grow and what functions to perform. DNA is unique to every person a chemical blueprint of instructions that creates each new life. This baby is ready to enter the world. A newborn person whose journey is about to begin. The journey starts with a challenge, breathe or die. These lungs have never breathed before. They're still full of amniotic fluid that protected them for nine long months. The newborn is in danger of drowning. Then, the body kicks into survival mode. The adrenal glands right above the kidneys, send adrenaline surging around the body. It shocks the lungs into life. Muscles we need to breathe suddenly start to spasm. And we take our first breath. It's the most important breath of our lives the first of 700 million. Our lungs will pump air every single second as long as we live. Air rushes down the windpipe, down thousands of branching tubes, and into nearly 30 million tiny air sacs, the alveoli. These air sacs pull oxygen into our blood and pump out the carbon dioxide we exhale with every breath. And they do it nonstop for 80 years. <laughs> At the moment of birth, everything changes. The physical link between mother and baby is broken for the first time. The first hour brings rapid change. All the baby's organs have to adapt to life outside the womb. 
it's a challenging and risky time. At this age, the heart is no bigger than a walnut. It's been pumping in the womb for eight months, but now it has flaws that could be fatal. Two holes, one in the aorta and one in the heart. In the womb, they diverted blood away from our inactive lungs. Now that we need the lungs, the holes seal shut. The heart is working normally, pumping blood through tens of thousands of miles of blood vessels. Other systems are also gearing up. The digestive tract is ready to clear itself out to make room for its first meal. The bowels are full of digested amniotic fluid and dead cells, a sticky green-black tar-like material called meconium. It's corrosive stuff. If it ends up in the baby's lungs during labor, it can attack the delicate lining. But here in the gut, meconium is harmless. The digestive tract flushes it out within days. As time passes, more sophisticated systems start to kick in. Our next challenge is the cold. It was 100 degrees in the womb. Here at home, 65 degree room temperature is a shock to the system. The area that controls temperature is deep within the base of our brains. When an adult is too cold or hot, this area sends out instructions for our cells to produce more or less energy. It's called the hypothalamus, and like all our other organs, at this age, it's still immature. The brain is under pressure, making 100 trillion calculations per second just to keep our bodies functioning. But it's still learning how, and now we're in danger of hypothermia. An infrared camera shows the struggle to keep warm as we lose precious body heat. The yellow areas show where we lose the most. Luckily, we're prepared. A layer of special tissue around our blood vessels and vital organs actively generates heat. It's fat, but this isn't regular fat. It's brown fat, a specialized type usually found in hibernating animals. It's packed with special heat-generating cells. Eventually, most of this fat will melt away as the hypothalamus matures and the liver and other organs take on the job of generating heat. Just hours old, we know almost nothing about the world. Everything we do relies on instinct. Feeding is a reflex. Normally, we have no more control over suckling than the urge to breathe. This is milk on its first journey down the esophagus to the stomach. Mother's milk is much more than the ultimate superfood. It also protects us from hidden danger. Outside the womb, bacteria are everywhere. 
invisible, and potentially deadly. Our day-old skin is under constant attack. There are 10 times more bacteria than human cells in and on our bodies. Our immune systems aren't developed yet, so we can't fight infections for ourselves. Amazingly, our mother fights them for us through her milk. The close contact between mother and baby means she absorbs the same germs that are attacking us. Her immune system creates antibodies. Then she delivers those antibodies back to us in her milk. Until our own immune systems develop, she will keep us safe. It's time to take on the world. It's been four weeks since birth. The baby has drunk nearly 30 pints of milk and has put on two pounds, a quarter of its body weight. It's time for its first trip outside. Even a visit to the grocery store can overload the senses. It's noisy, bright, and smelly. The nose is working overtime. High up inside, specialized nerves dangle in the airstream. They detect chemicals in the air and send an electrical signal to the brain, which interprets the signals as smells. The nerves are super sensitive. Every smell is a new sensation. The same goes for our hearing. Strange new world, strange new sounds. Sound waves vibrate the eardrum. On the other side of the eardrum, these tiny bones, the ossicles, vibrate in response. They're the smallest bones in the body, but without them, we would never hear a thing. They use leverage to amplify the vibrations, hitting the eardrum 22 times. The amplified vibrations now enter the inner ear, or cochlea. It's lined with delicate hairs. When vibrations pass through, the hairs vibrate. At the base are the fragile hairs for high-frequency sounds. At the top, low-frequency hairs, each one 200 times thinner than a hair on our head. Over time, loud noises will damage these hairs. But at this age, they're perfect. Our hearing will never be this good again. The story is different for eyesight. We're born with very underdeveloped vision. Even at one month, the world is blurred and mostly black and white. Every aspect of our vision is rudimentary. The eye muscles are immature, keeping us from pointing our eyes where we want to.
inside the eye, the lens muscles still can't focus, and the lens flips the image it receives. All through life, we see the world upside down. The picture only gets reoriented in our brains. Right now, the picture is on the retina, the screen at the back of the eye. The retina has two types of cells, rods and cones, which transform the light that hits them into electric signals. The cones detect color information, but because they're not developed yet, we see mostly in black and white during our first month. From the retina, the signals travel along two thick nerves under the brain. At the back is where we process visual information. When the image arrives, the real challenge begins. Our immature brains haven't learned to interpret the data yet. That's changing fast. At two months, we can distinguish colors and shades. At four months, we can identify our mother's face. By eight months, we have 20-20 vision. Along with our perfect eyesight comes a growth spurt. We start packing on pounds. We add a quarter to our body weight every month. After three months, it slows down. Lucky for us, if we kept growing that fast, we'd weigh 150 tons by age four, the same as a blue whale. At eight months, all our senses work. We're beginning to explore the world, and the sense we use most is touch. Touch something too hot, and temperature sensors in the skin send nerve signals racing up the arm, up the spinal cord, and into the brain, all at 200 miles per hour. The brain detects the signal, interprets it as pain, and fires another signal back to the muscles. We move the hand away. We have sensory nerve receptors all over our skin but some areas are more sensitive than others. The hands, face, and mouth. There are 9,000 sensory receptors on the tongue alone, which is why babies use their mouths to explore. But there's another reason for all the gnawing. Something painful is happening inside the baby's mouth. Her first teeth are coming through. Milk teeth form deep in our gums while we're still in the womb. Now, one by one, they burst through. It's painful, but it's progress. At eight months into life's 80-year journey, the senses are operating at full capacity. Every sensation is a new surprise. And with her new teeth, she can take on more solid foods. Digestion starts in the mouth. Teeth grind up the food. Then special glands under the tongue pump out saliva to help break down and lubricate the food on its 12-hour, 13-foot journey through the gut. It'll pass from the stomach into the coils of the small intestine, 
before finally passing into the large intestine. Waves of contracting muscle keep the food moving, a process called peristalsis. These contractions are so powerful, we can even eat upside down. For the first time, a new camera shows a high-definition view of how food travels through our bodies and into our stomachs. Food enters the stomach through a hole at the top. The stomach is a bag of muscle that churns, squashes, and squeezes food into liquid. At the same time, acids break the food down. The stomach walls protect themselves with a lining of mucus. Without it, the acids could digest parts of the stomach itself, causing stomach ulcers. About an hour later, the stomach squeezes the broken down food out through a tiny hole called the pyloric sphincter. The food enters the small intestine, an 11-foot coil of tube where we absorb most of the nutrients. The interior wall of the small intestine is lined with millions of microscopic projections called villi. These increase the surface area of the gut, making it easier to absorb nutrients. First, the pancreas pumps out a juice that neutralizes stomach acid. Then bile from the liver breaks down the fats into tiny droplets. Smaller droplets are easier for the intestine to absorb. After an hour and a half, the small intestine has absorbed most of the nutrients from the food. It's time for what remains to move on. It enters the large intestine through this, the ileocecal sphincter a valve that keeps our food from going back where it came from. What's left is a mix of waste food and dead cells from the walls of the gut. The large intestine's main job is to extract water from it. Lots of bacteria live here too, but it isn't because of an infection. We actually need them. They produce enzymes that break down complex carbohydrates in our food, carbohydrates we couldn't otherwise digest. Finally, after about 12 hours, we expel what's left of our first meal. One year old. We're mobile. We've perfected the art of crawling. Our bones are stronger. They need to be. 
were getting pretty heavy. At birth, the skeleton is mostly cartilage, the same material as our ears. Cartilage is flexible. It's what allows us to squeeze through the birth canal. But after birth, our soft skeletons are a problem. They need to be rigid to support our growing bodies and protect our vital organs. So right from birth, the cartilage starts to harden. Special cells called osteoblasts lay down minerals that turn soft cartilage into hard bone. Some bones even fuse together. At birth, we have gaps between the plates of the skull, which allow the skull to deform during birth. Through our first year, these gaps gradually close until the skull is finally complete. As our skeletons develop, so does our desire to get around. We're about to hit one of the major milestones in life, standing on two feet. The key isn't strength, it's balance. And the secret to standing is hidden deep in our ears. Beyond the ossicles, the bones we use for hearing, the inner ear is made up of three looping structures. Each loop is the size of a dime, and they're oriented to cover all three planes. These semicircular canals are part of our ears, but they have nothing to do with hearing. They're filled with liquid, and they tell us what's up, what's down, and what's on the level. The liquid inside sloshes against sensor hairs lining the tubes. The hairs send data to the brain about how we are oriented and our direction of movement. These are our organs of balance. Once we've mastered balance, we're one step closer to walking. Now there's no limit to where we can go and what we can learn. from a baby to a toddler. We're embarking on our most formative years, a time when we'll put our growing brains and developing immune systems to the test. Age two. We've survived infancy and can stand on our own two feet. Next up, is a uniquely human challenge, learning to talk. <laughs> Talking takes a lot of brain power. A two-year-old learns 10 new words a day. This is Broca's area the region at the side of the brain used for speech production and comprehension. <laughs> Language is what separates us from other animals. We exchange complex thoughts and ideas 
and teach our children not just by showing, but by telling. As our brains develop, we gain other uniquely human qualities. We're aware of our own identities and individuality. We gain the ability to think for ourselves and we're forming memories that will last a lifetime, like our first day at school. We may remember what was going on around us, but the real action is happening inside. The brain is a mass of 100 billion nerve cells. Between them, they generate enough electricity to keep a light bulb burning for a day. The cells communicate using electric impulses. Each impulse is a tiny fragment of thought or memory. When we hear a new word, our ears convert the sound into electrical impulses in our brains. The brain can learn because the connections between brain cells aren't permanent. The brain rewires itself. Nerve cells send out tendrils called axons, constantly forming new connections. The cells meet at a tiny gap called a synapse. Chemicals bridge the gap to allow the impulse to continue the chain. The new connections form a pattern, a new memory. We learn by making new connections between brain cells and then reinforcing them through repetition. The stronger the reinforcement, the more likely the memory will stick. What does the word veteran mean? When someone asks us to recall that memory, the same pattern of axons fires, and the memory comes alive. Our brains respond by sending messages to the nerves that drive the muscles in our arms. We raise our hands. In childhood, our brains are primed to learn, and they're growing fast. The rapid growth allows our brains to easily form new connections, an ability that will fade with age. And while our brains keep learning, our bodies do the same. It's the immune system's job to learn to recognize infections. Every germ that enters the body carries the potential threat of disease. But first, the germ has to get there. Immunity doesn't begin inside our bodies. We start fighting germs the moment they touch us. We have an arsenal of defenses against infection. Our eyebrows and eyelashes, ear hairs, and nasal hairs catch airborne bacteria. Sweat, tears, and mucus wash them off. Our skin constantly sheds its top layer of cells, taking bacteria with it. The mouth is especially vulnerable. Here, too, we are armed and ready to fire. Each squirt of saliva contains lysozyme, 
an enzyme specially targeted to destroy bacteria. Our saliva glands are tiny, yet they produce nearly half a gallon of saliva every single day. Sometimes, a pathogen breaks through these external defenses and our immature immune system reacts to prevent infection. Tiny viruses travel through our blood and probe our skin cells for signs of weakness. The virus hijacks a cell and manufactures thousands of copies of it. Then, the infected cell ruptures, spreading even more viruses around the body. This particular virus causes a rash, chickenpox. The fever that comes with infection is a sign that the body is fighting back. Heat slows down the spread of the disease because viruses don't reproduce well when it's hot. The immune system kicks into action. White blood cells latch onto infected cells and pump in poisonous proteins, which kills the cell and the viruses. Crusty skin blisters signal the battle waged between the immune system and its viral assailants. Each one contains cellular debris and the remains of a hundred thousand viruses. It may be unpleasant, but getting diseases like this when we're young is vital for our developing immune systems. Our bodies create memory molecules against the virus, antibodies. We used to rely on antibodies from mother's milk. Now, we make our own. If we catch the same disease when we're older, the antibodies enable our bodies to recognize the virus instantly. White blood cells wipe it out before it has a chance to take hold. This is why childhood is the perfect time for vaccination. Vaccines are harmless doses of viruses like mumps, polio, or rubella. The body creates antibodies as if it had really been infected. Now, if we ever catch the real thing, the body will recognize it and attack. In its first decade, the human body changes beyond recognition. But now comes the biggest change of them all, the roller coaster ride of puberty. By age 11, puberty is already underway for most. But there's no schedule. For some, it happens later, some earlier. It depends on our DNA clocks, our lifestyles, even our diets. Whether 10 or 13, female or male, it begins in the brain for all of us. At the base, the hypothalamus, the same region that controls our body temperature. Puberty starts when the hypothalamus releases a protein, K2. 
kiss peptin into the brain. The kiss peptin triggers the release of other hormones in a chain reaction throughout the body. Only then do our sex organs begin to mature. In girls, that means ovulation. This is a high-definition view of a woman's ovaries, the off-white organs in the center. This unique footage from Gold Coast IVF Fertility Center in New York shows an actual egg inside a protective blister of fluid. During ovulation, an egg bursts from the ovary and travels down the fallopian tube to the uterus. From now until menopause, the same thing will happen every month. Then, menstruation clears the uterus of unfertilized eggs. The ovaries not only produce eggs, they also produce a potent cocktail of chemicals. They release hormones into the bloodstream, including estrogen. These hormones have dramatic, lasting emotional and physical effects. Both boys and girls experience a growth spurt. Women and men's body shapes diverge. Girls become women. Boys become men. Male brains also release kisspeptin to trigger puberty. A flood of new hormones stimulates the testicles. Generate a tenfold surge in testosterone, the hormone that creates the physical characteristics of manhood. The larynx opens up and tilts forward. The vocal cords stretch wider. The longer chords vibrate at a lower pitch. The voice deepens. Testosterone stimulates the growth of body hair and doubles muscle mass, including 40% more heart muscle. These are changes we can see and hear, but changes are going on that we can't see. In the brain, nerve cells undergo extensive rewiring, transforming our mood and character. Both sexes experience a flood of new emotions, and one beats them all. For the first time, both sexes find the other sexually attractive. From the inside out, our bodies are overwhelmed by new sensations. Our pulse races. Our blood pressure rises. Our lips gorge. Our cheeks flush with blood. All signs that we desire someone. And if the desire turns out to be mutual, 
we hit another major milestone, our first kiss. In its first two decades, the human body accomplishes something close to miraculous. We're nearly four times our original height, 21 times heavier. We've digested 9,000 tons of food. Our hearts have beaten over a billion times. Our lungs have drawn over 200 million breaths. Now, with puberty behind us, we're ready, in mind and body, to become adults. Our early 20s, childhood and puberty are behind us. This is the start of a new phase in our lives, adulthood. We've flown the nest. What happens now is up to us. In our 20s, we look and feel better than at any other time in our lives. We're in our prime, both outside and in. Trillions of cells make up our organs and tissues. Over time, these wear out or get damaged, but new cells grow and divide to replace the old ones. Our body replaces entire organs, so it's no wonder we feel good. Essentially, every 10 years, we get a brand new body. Some tissues regenerate even faster, like our hair and nails, which requires a quick trip to the salon every so often. Hairs are made from modified dead skin cells. Each hair grows from a follicle embedded in the skin. The modified cells grow here, then die as new cells push them upward. The column of dead cells is the hair. Each person grows an incredible seven miles of hair every year. Our hair grows whether we want it to or not, but other parts of our body are partially under our control. Choices we make now, like exercising, affect us for the rest of our lives. It has an effect throughout the body, helping cells and organs stay in peak condition. Our muscles are also building. This is a new imaging technique that combines the highest resolution CT scans with cutting edge computer power. It's called volumetic, and it shows how our 650 skeletal muscles make up to a third of our adult body weight. It's been suggested that if all the muscles in the body work together, they would generate enough power to lift more than 11 tons the weight of more than four SUVs. Muscles are made from bundles of fibers. A good workout rips these fibers apart, but our cells repair the damage by adding extra material. The muscle grows back bigger and stronger through choices we made. Unfortunately, some choices are less beneficial. Some expose us to damage that even our youthful cells can't repair.
parties are a part of life in our 20s. We all know smoke can damage the lungs. But smoke isn't the only hazard here. Our hearing is under threat too, from loud noise. The problem is deep inside the ear. The fragile sensory hairs in the cochlea, or stereocilia, turn sound into nerve impulses. Loud noise destroys these irreplaceable cells. The hairs that respond to high frequencies are most affected, maybe because high-pitched sounds shake their foundations more violently. The effect is too small to notice. But the frequency range of our hearing is already shrinking. Another source of damage is alcohol. As we absorb alcohol into our bloodstream, it affects both our organs and our state of mind. It raises our blood pressure and makes our heartbeat irregular. We relax, lose our inhibitions, and our coordination. These symptoms are a consequence of chemical reactions in the brain, especially in this region, the cerebellum. It controls coordination and balance. When we drink, alcohol affects the cerebellum's brain cells. Some synapses accept the signal more frequently. Others become totally blocked. The more we drink, the more extreme the effect. It may feel good now, but there'll be a price to pay later. After a party, Time passes, and we get to know our limits. Now, new challenges are on the horizon. To find love and have children of our own. Our late 20s. Childhood is a distant memory, but not the thrill of our first kiss. That was pure lust. Now it's time for something new. It's time to fall in love. Many of us meet our future partners at work. We may think the attraction is social or physical, but a lot of it is biological. We use our eyes to size up our date. But looks aren't everything. Attraction is also about smell. Inside the nose, olfactory nerves do more than detect smells. They also detect chemicals we can't smell, pheromones odorless hormonal messages we release in our sweat. Pheromones carry information about our genetic health and our ability to resist disease. 
Our brains use these signals to help choose a partner with the best possible genes for our children. Love is more than just an emotion. It's all about chemistry. We release adrenaline into the blood. Our heart pounds. We can't sleep. When that happens, another hormone comes into play. The brain floods with dopamine the feel-good hormone. It's as potent as cocaine, makes us euphoric, and it's addictive. It leaves us wanting more. We start thinking about commitment and eventually marriage. Love, both chemical and emotional, wins the day. It's a relationship we hope will last a lifetime, and the process of long-term bonding is chemical. Sex isn't just about procreation or recreation. It chemically strengthens the bond between us. Both partners' pituitary glands pump the blood full of a substance called oxytocin, sometimes called the bonding hormone. It's the very same hormone that binds us to our mothers as newborns. Some anthropologists believe oxytocin could be evolution's way of creating a bond that's strong enough to endure the trials of parenthood. for parenthood is now. The man releases sperm. The goal, to find the egg. An egg ripens and bursts from the woman's ovary, the largest cell in the human body. It passes into the fallopian tube, ready for fertilization. Sperm are the smallest cells in the human body, and they have a tough journey ahead of them. First, they have to survive the hostile environment of the vagina. Its secretions are acidic to prevent bacterial infection, but they also kill sperm. Ejaculation releases 300 million sperm, but only thousands will make it as far as the cervix. The surviving sperm swim into the uterus and fallopian tube. Muscular contractions in the walls of the fallopian tube help guide the sperm toward the egg. Only a few hundred make it this far. And only one will succeed in fertilizing the egg. This truly is survival of the fittest. 10 hours later, the strongest of 300 million sperm is the one to pass on its genes.
So far, there's no sign of conception. We're totally unaware that we're about to embark on a new chapter in our lives. Over the next 40 weeks, a single cell will develop into a perfectly formed baby. Often, the first symptom is morning sickness. No one knows for sure what causes the nausea. One theory is that it protects the fetus from toxins in food, which could harm its organs during this critical phase of development. Another theory is that nausea is a side effect of the mother's immune system as it weakens to avoid attacking the developing embryo. The fetus is effectively a parasite. It saps the mother's energy as it draws what it needs from her body. It has its own life support system, the placenta. Here, the mother's blood passes nutrients across a membrane into the fetal blood. With this constant supply of nourishment, the fetus grows over 30 ounces in its first 10 weeks. The uterus expands to 1,000 times its normal size, just to hold it. That extra space has to come from somewhere, so the mother's body rearranges itself internally. This woman isn't pregnant, but her organs are still a tight fit. In a pregnant woman, the organs get squeezed and some are pushed up into her chest. Not only are the organs squished, now they're working for two. The lungs and heart work harder than ever before. To make space, muscles and tendons in the spine relax and it curves out of its normal shape. The stomach is also compressed and rotated through 45 degrees. It can only hold small amounts of food and drink and still the growing baby demands more. After nine months, it's time to give birth. And pushing out a seven pound baby can be quite a challenge. Softened tendons allow the pelvis to open up the birth canal. But even so, it's a cramped space. Volumetic imaging shows the claustrophobic route the baby has to take, with a tight twist to get around the tailbone. Sometimes it's too tight of a squeeze for mother and baby. The only option for a safe delivery is surgery, a cesarean section. From a newborn baby to becoming a parent in 30 years, the circle of life goes on. Our 20s are behind us. Our bodies are about to enter a new period of change as the aging process takes hold.
Some experts believe that we all start aging from the moment we're born. The body's repair systems compensate. But now, the repair systems themselves are aging. The changes in our appearance are getting noticeable. We're in our 40s. The cumulative effect of years in the sun causes the first symptom, wrinkles. Since birth, our skin cells have replenished our skin at an astonishing rate. We can make up to 30,000 new skin cells every minute to replace the dead cells we're constantly shedding. By 45, we've created more than 400 pounds of dust from old skin cells. Whatever our age, our skin cells are never more than a few months old. The skin cells are fine. The problem is the stuff that binds them together, collagen. Ultraviolet radiation in sunlight triggers a molecular chain reaction that degrades collagen. The fibers get thin and break. Our skin loses elasticity, and we get wrinkles. Our eyesight is also changing. A few years ago, we could easily read without glasses. The problem is in the lens. Inner lens cells, along with heart cells and most brain cells, are among the only cells our bodies never replace. They're exactly the same lens cells we had as babies. As we get older, the lenses gradually stiffen. They don't focus as well. And our eyes start to dry out. We produce less fluid to lubricate the eye and fewer tears to flush out debris. Middle age also changes the shape of our bodies. Exercise alone isn't enough to keep us in shape anymore. At 20, it was easy. We could eat what we wanted, do what we wanted. Now our metabolism is changing and it's easier to put on weight. The explanation is in our blood. In middle age, the level of several hormones start to drop. Estrogen, testosterone, and growth hormones. And we start to lose lean muscle. We lose about six and a half pounds of muscle during each decade of our adult lives. Less muscle means the body burns fewer calories. We need less fuel. If we continue to eat like we used to, the surplus food gets converted into this, fat.
For women, fat tends to go to their hips. It's the body's way of providing a steady energy supply for pregnancy. Men store fat in a different area, their bellies. Belly fat evolved for quick energy release. It helped sustain our male ancestors during hunting trips. Our ability to metabolize fat slows down as we age. Inside each cell in our bodies, there are tiny structures called mitochondria. These are the body's power plants. They combine nutrients from food with oxygen from the lungs to release energy. As we get older, the number of mitochondria dwindles and we lose the ability to metabolize fat as efficiently. Too many calories and a drop in metabolic rate can be a lethal combination. Fat is much more than an extra inch on our waistline. It spreads throughout the entire body. For the first time, a high-definition endoscope inserted through the navel reveals the full extent of fat cover inside the abdomen. The intestines are smothered in yellow fat deposits. Fat finds its way into almost every available space of our bodies, even inside our blood vessels. Deposits build up on the inner walls, narrowing the tube. The heart has to work harder to pump blood through the restricted vessels. In extreme cases, fat can block the vessels completely. If fat blocks the arteries that supply the heart, the result can be fatal. The heart muscles are deprived of oxygen and nutrients. The muscle risks going into spasm, a heart attack. Heart disease is the biggest killer in the Western world. Fat isn't the only risk to our health as we age. Stress also plays a damaging role. Middle-aged life is stressful. Holding down a job and raising teenage kids. Stress is exhausting, but the damage doesn't stop there. It also speeds up the aging process. Fifty years old. Our bodies may be slowing down, but our lifestyles aren't. A growing family and a demanding career add up to another influence on the aging process, stress. We all recognize the outward signs of stress. Sweaty palms, shortness of breath, a dizzy feeling. But the real damage takes place inside. Our bodies instinctively shift into fight or flight mode. Hormones, adrenaline, and cortisol flood from the adrenal gland into our bloodstream. Our muscles contract, arteries constrict, the heart pumps faster, and our blood pressure hits the roof. We evolved the fight or flight reflex to quickly respond to attacks from predators. To have the reflex triggering so constantly, 
causes irreparable harm to our cardiovascular network. Stress accelerates the aging of our blood vessels. High blood pressure damages cells in the artery walls. They become stiff and thick. Especially here in the biggest artery, the aorta. Arteries with stiff walls restrict blood flow. As our blood pressure rises, the heart is forced to work harder. It's a vicious cycle. The more stressed we get, the more we damage our blood vessels. And the more we damage our blood vessels, the less we're able to deal with the effects of stress. If the problem gets out of control, the heart becomes enlarged as it struggles to force blood through our narrow, less elastic blood vessels. High blood pressure can even rupture blood vessels in the brain, a stroke. Most of us learn to manage stress. But for women in their 50s, another factor compounds the problem, menopause. In her 50s, a woman's ovaries stop releasing eggs. They also stop producing the sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, which signals the end of a woman's reproductive life. As the supply of hormones winds down, it destabilizes the regions of the brain that deal with mood, sleep, and temperature control. When the hypothalamus is thrown off course, hot flashes occur, moments when the body can't set its thermostat correctly. muscle tissues weaken. The woman's body has spent its whole life getting accustomed to these hormones. Now they're gone, and the aging process accelerates. Our 60s come and go. Our kids leave home, and we leave work we enter a new phase of life, old age. In 70 years, we've grown from a tiny baby to an adult, from child to parent to grandparent. The aging process began several decades ago. Now, we're in the grip of old age. It's the final chapter in the journey of life. When we retire from work, we gain a slower lifestyle and our bodies slow down. The outward signs of aging are only the beginning. Aging also dramatically affects our skeletons. Any of us could be at risk for osteoporosis.
our bone cells are still hard at work, destroying old bone and replacing it with new. But old age upsets this balance. Osteoclasts destroy the bone faster than osteoblasts can rebuild it. What remains is a hollowed out cluster of brittle bone fibers. Our bones slowly crumble as the years slide by. Broken bones become a very real danger. It can happen to men and women alike. But the process is faster in women because of the hormonal changes of menopause. The aging process is one of the great mysteries of life. Why does our appearance change so much between the ages of 40 and 70? It's more than wear and tear. It's a process affecting every cell in our bodies. Every day, cells clone themselves into billions to battle wear and tear on our organs. The DNA inside each cell gets copied. The old cells die off and the new ones take their place. But the copying system isn't perfect. Any imperfections in our DNA are also duplicated. Over a lifetime, we make so many copies of ourselves that even the tiniest defects accumulate. It's like using a photocopier. Copies made from copies degrade in quality. We have totally replaced the bone in our face every 10 years since we were born. Our 70-year-old face is a seventh generation copy of our baby face. The imperfections are exaggerated with each copy. Another reason for aging could be the air that we breathe. We need oxygen to live, but throughout our lives, it slowly poisons us. Inside each of our cells, our mitochondria are like tiny power plants, combining food with oxygen. They create the energy we need, but just like a power plant, they also generate pollution. In this case, the pollutant is oxygen. The mitochondria change the molecules into unstable forms called free radicals. Over a lifetime, free radicals slowly suffocate the mitochondria and damage our cells. Our cells and DNA become more and more damaged. Repair systems fail. Imperfections accumulate. Eventually, our organs fail.
even with a healthy lifestyle and the best medicine, death is unavoidable. Our DNA makes us what we are and guides our development, but it also determines how long we live. Every time one of our cells copies itself, it loses a tiny piece from the end of the DNA. After billions of cell divisions, the end section is gone. Our cells can't divide anymore. Death, like life, is a biological process. Scientists believe that near the moment of death, our bloodstream is flooded with endorphins, the body's natural painkillers. Now, starved of oxygen, tissues can't function. Within 10 seconds, the brain's electrical activity drops. the last sense to go. It can take 24 hours for our skin cells to stop dividing. It's final impulse. There's a saying that life goes on. For some of us, it could go on for some time. Thanks to modern medicine, children born in the US today can expect to live to celebrate their 77th birthday and beyond. Even when we're gone, we live on through our loved ones. Our children and their children carry our genes in every cell. They carry memories of us too, the moments they've shared from our extraordinary story. All journeys must come to an end. But what a journey it's been.